Hey guys, my name is Jonathan Howard. I appreciate you joining me today as we look at a passage of Scripture from the book of Ephesians chapter 2. You know, the iPhone's been out for a little over a decade now, and one of my favorite parts about it is the camera. I love being able to have a quality camera that I carry around with me all the time, fits right in my pocket, pull it out and capture those impromptu moments. The kids are doing something silly, you're in front of something beautiful, great sunset, whatever the, the case may be. I love being able to capture those moments on a camera that's on my phone, but in addition to that, it captures really quality pictures. And so it's great to be able to collect those and have those at my fingertips on my phone at any given time. I can share them with my parents, you know, whoever that I may want to uh, share those moments with. And so, you know, I have a theory about photos in general, but about the photo album on your phone. If you were to give me access to that, very quickly I'd be learn a lot about you. I'd be able to find out some identity information about you because within those pictures I'd see places that you frequent. I'd be able to learn about the spots that you go to on a regular basis and maybe even begin to learn why you go there. Maybe you show up at the same football stadium seven to eight times in the fall and so I'd, I'd be able to learn that you're a fan of a certain team or maybe there's the same people that keep showing up in your pictures and I would know that these are the people that are in the circle of your influence and who are influencing you and they're the people that you're doing life with and they're the people that are shaping who you are becoming or maybe you've got some big moments, some achievements, maybe you're cap and gown, maybe you're in a, a bridal dress, uh, but these life defining achieving moments that you're able to to utilize in life and so I'd be able to learn about those and maybe there'd be some pictures in there that don't make a lot of sense and they were accidents and whatever but for the most part those pictures are taken on purpose maybe you take a picture of the sunset every single night so I'd be able to learn that you enjoy nature you think it's beautiful and so as I begin to look at the different pictures in your album I begin to learn identity information about you and that's what we're going to talk about tonight is identity information. In the book of Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is writing a letter and in there he is providing some information about what it means to be a believer. What Jesus has done on our behalf and what it means, the implications for us moving forward. And so within this passage we're going to see three very clear pictures that are in the photo album of our life. So let's read together in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in the first verse, and we'll read about eight verses. It says this in Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Verse 4, But God, being rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Verse 7, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So eight verses, all about identity information. Let's look at three different pictures that are in the album of our lives. The first picture is this. It's a picture of us, and it shows us being in need. We are separated from God. It is a dire picture. It is not a good picture. This is bad news. We're starting with bad news first today. And so we are separated from God. It's that we're on a path that leads to destruction. We are headed nowhere good, and we are headed there quickly. We are in need. And Paul says we get there for three different reasons. One of the reasons why we're in need is because of corruption. In verse 1 it says that we have trespassed against God. The definition of trespass is to commit an offense against a person or a set of rules or an organization. And that makes intuitive sense. We've all seen no trespass signs posted around in different places. And so the moment we decide to go beyond that marker, we trespass. We commit an offense by going somewhere 
we shouldn't have gone or doing something we should not have done. And so Scripture says that when we trespass, we have sinned against God, and the result of that is that we are dead. We are spiritually dead. We are separated from God, and there is nothing that we can do to make that right. We cannot close the gap on our own. We are powerless to be able to close that gap and be rightly connected with God. And so we are in need because of corruption. We're also in need because we're in a, a, a world and in a domain that is held captive by Satan. In verse 2, he refers to Satan as the prince of the power of the air. And what he's highlighting the fact is that Satan has been given domain here in this world. That God has granted him the ability to move and to act and to work for his purposes and what he wants to do, which we know is the exact opposite of God's mission. And so he seeks to slow us down. He seeks to kill and to destroy. He seeks to keep us blinded to the truth of God's love and his work of salvation for us. And so throughout the New Testament, we see different titles that are given to Satan. There are some different ones. Uh, in Matthew 9, 34, he's called the ruler of demons. In John chapter 12, 31, he's the prince of the world. Over in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he's referred to as the God of this age. That verse says, In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so the devil seeks to blind us to Christ so that at the end of life, we'll arrive at a death and a destructive destination, not finding life in Christ. And even if you have given your life to Jesus, he seeks to blind you so that he'd slow you down and you would not reach your full potential within Christ and be the most like Christ that you could be. And so because of trespassing against God's rules, because of Satan and what he's trying to do to blind you to his truth, but also because of condemnation. We are a people who are in need. Paul says here and in other places, like in Romans 3.23, that we've all sinned. We've all messed up. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And because of that, we are condemned. There is a heavy consequence for sin. Just one sin separates us from God from now and for eternity unless we receive salvation and help and allow God to help us make it right. So we are all, uh, we are all condemned. We are all falling short. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. So every person has this picture in their photo album. Every person is a person who is in need, who is separated from God because of sin, because we've all sinned. We've all fallen short, and we're all in need of someone to intervene on our behalf. The good news is the second picture in our photo album is a picture of God who is a Savior who intervenes on our behalf. The definition of intervening is to step into a situation and to improve it, to make it better. And that is exactly what God did when He sent Jesus, who He left the throne, He stepped into our world, He put on skin, He lived a perfect life, He did everything that the Father asked Him to do while never sinning, and He died on the cross for you and I. He paid the price, He paid the sinner's death for us even though he had done nothing wrong. And so he's buried. Three days later, he's resurrected back to life. And when he was resurrected back to life, not only did he defeat physical death, but in that moment, he defeated spiritual death because through him, we can have spiritual life. We can have victory over sin. We don't have to fall and trespass over and over and over again. And instead, we get to live in victory through him living in us. And so the second picture is a picture of God intervening on our behalf. And so he did step in to our circumstance and he did that motivated by his love for us. We see that in verse 4. It says, God being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us. It all stems out of his love. It's an agape love. It's a benevolent love that takes willful delight in the object of his love. God loves you very much. God loves you enough to lay it all on the line, to give it all up for you. He died for you because he loves you that much. You know, this agape love, it is not just a vocal love. It's not just a love that we say and express through words. It is expressed through action. And that is why Jesus took action. He intervened. He stepped into your story. He stepped into humanity and made it possible for you to have rightful relationship 
with him. So it was born out of his great love, but he extended the, in, the intervention towards us out of mercy. Scripture says that he's rich in mercy. He provides a way off the destructive path before we ever understood we were on a bad path. And so he showed us a way by paying for our debt. Because of his mercy, we do not have to pay the price that we deserve. We receive a less consequence than what we deserve, and that is mercy. And scripture says in this passage that God is rich in his mercy. And he's rich in his mercy because he gives it because he wants to, not out of obligation. If he felt like he had to, it wouldn't be so abundant. It wouldn't be so meaningful. But the fact that he did what he did for us, that he intervened on our behalf because he wanted to, not because anybody made him, increases the level of the love that he expressed through his mercy. But this intervention, it's, it comes out of his great love, it's extended in mercy, but then it's also extended to us and given to us in grace. Grace is receiving that which I don't deserve and what I cannot do for myself. And that is salvation in a nutshell. He did for us the thing we could not do. He paid the price that we could not pay. And so when we receive the gift of salvation, we're receiving all the benefits of all the things that He has paid for being rightly related with God, having the ability to not sin, to live in righteousness and be holy and to become more like Jesus on a daily basis. And so God paid our debt so that we could experience Him. He loves you that much that He comes to you. He doesn't sit back and hope that maybe you can find Him. Not at all. He intervened. He stepped in to your situation and made a way for you to have life in Him. And it changes our whole reality. Now we're able to defeat sin. Now we're able to respond the right way. Now we can walk in a joy that passes all understanding. What a great picture this second picture is. We all have this picture in the photo album of our life. God died for every one of us. God paid the price for every one of us. God loves each and every one of us. But there's also a third picture. And this picture is not in the photo album of every one of us. And this has to do about who we are when we accept Jesus. When we are in Christ, we are a new creation. It talks about that in verse 8. It talks about how salvation is solely a work of God. Only God can save you. There is nothing that you or I can do to save us. It's not about how much I go to church. It's not about if I've ever been baptized. It's not about my church attendance and how much I give. It's not about any of that. It's not about doing good things. It's about having a right relationship with God. Having that moment in life where I have given my life to Jesus. I've admitted that I was a sinner. I've admitted that I can't do it on my own. And that Jesus, because of how He lived and how He died, because He resurrected back to life, that He paid the price. And I'm trusting my eternal soul with what He has done and receiving the gift of salvation. And so because it is a work that only God can do, I can't boast about it. All I can do is boast about Him and give testimony and praise and worship to Him because salvation is about Jesus. We also see in verse 8 that salvation is received in faith. Faith is how I appropriate my sin. It's how, or my faith. That's my salvation. That's how I appropriate my salvation. That's how I live it out. Yes, I receive it in a moment, but then every day forward, I live by faith, trusting God, being obedient to His truth in my life, His direction, understanding that He has a plan for me and that I can trust it and that He will shape me to be more like Him and He'll put me in the places I need to be each and every day when I live by faith. And so salvation, it is a gift. He can give it to me, He can extend it to me, but until I open it, until I unwrap it, until I take a hold of it and I live in it, it does me no good. And so even if we were to read on in verse 10, it talks about how we were made for good works that He has already set up. And so once I become a believer, I am focused on living in Him, living in righteousness, allowing Him to lead and guide and direct me. So three pictures. The first two pictures everybody has in their photo album of their life. We are all the people who are in need, separated from God. The second picture, there is a God who loves us enough that He intervened on our behalf. And He stepped into our circumstance to make it better. And then the third picture is only in the photo albums of the lives of people who have given their life to Jesus. Now the good news is this, the third picture can be in everybody's photo album. 
And so I would encourage you today, if there's never been a moment in time where you have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that you could do that today. It's as simple as admitting that you're a sinner, that you are separated from Him, and that the only way to be saved is to trust that Jesus is in fact God, that He died on a cross for you, that He resurrected from the dead three days later, and He's now seated on the throne with Father God. And when we trust in that moment, He says that He will come in and He will live and He will never leave us. And so if that is you today, I would encourage you to make that decision. It's the best decision that you can make. If you already have all three of those pictures in the photo album of your life, then I would encourage you and hope and challenge you to continue living in the good works that He has set up for you to do, walking in obedience, because each time we do that, we are giving evidence of Jesus in our lives so that the watching world around us can see what it looks like to reflect Jesus on a daily basis. I want to say thank you so much for joining me today. We'll be praying for you. hope that you would make the right decision that God has laid on your heart today. May God be honored and glorified what happens in this place. God bless.